This is Robert Demers for Con Men here at the Fantasia International Film Festival, and I'm with Darren Paul Fisher, the writer and director of OXV The Manual, which is playing here at the festival. How are you doing today, sir? I'm very good, thank you. How have you been enjoying Montreal so far? Um, really, really well, but um, I arrived yesterday at 7 a.m. and was, had the premiere last night, so I've enjoyed the nightlife of Montreal more than the daylife, but it's uh, been a beautiful sunny day, so I'm going to try and get out this afternoon and, and see some of Montreal. Can you please tell our audience a little bit about the film? Um, it's hard to describe the film in, in, in those kind of the, the, those short, you know, pitching sentences, but I'll give it a go. Um, so there's, there's two ways of thinking about it. One, the, the very short version is it's, uh, it's basically a boy meets girl story set in an alternate universe. Um, the next level of that is, is a way of thinking about it is it's kind of a Romeo and Juliet story. Um, but instead of the parents trying to, to keep, the, keep them apart, it's, um, it's the laws of nature. So again, it tells you a bit more, but you know, it's um, uh, it's something that's um, it uh, the, the the story behind everything. There's certain things that I kind of want to give away. There's things I don't want to give away in terms of what the audiences know when they walk into the into the cinema. Um, uh, we call it an alternate reality romantic mystery. So there you go. If any of those helpful, then uh, let me know. <laughs> uh, what was the inspiration to write this film? I mean, back at the very, very beginning, the, the, the genesis of the project was, um, and it sounds very lighthearted, um, which is really, it was a way of exploring through fiction uh, why I never win at raffles. Um, but, but really, I mean, it, it, I mean, I mean that, while that's completely true, I mean, it, it, basically when I was younger and um, I was uh, going out with a, a young lady and we... We you know, were at some event and it was raffles and, you know, she bought some tickets, I bought some tickets. I had no expectation of winning because there were hundreds of people and she had a genuine expectation she was going to win a prize. And she did. And she, to her entire life, she always won at raffles. And I would never win at raffles. And I was like, and it was just a way, it kind of polarized that there are those kind of people that, whether you call them what a natural timing or they always walk in the sun or they land on their feet, all these ways of expressing it. Um, there are, you know, it just kind of polarizes this kind of idea, and obviously, I, I count myself as somebody that doesn't have that kind of luck, and so I'm really interested, and in, I wouldn't say obsessed, but I'm I'm really intrigued with this idea of luck and of fate, and 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 that was the that was a real genesis, and then such so to sort of um, you know, build that into kind of a fictional world in the story. OXV is a little bit different from your past films. Uh, what made you decide to go in this direction? Um, it's interesting. I think the. From the outside, you know, it's just the films that get made that define you. I mean, I was always writing stuff like this, but it was the, the kind of the, the, the teen comedies that were getting made. So to, to, to the extent I was starting to get sort of typecast as a, as a kind of teen comedy writer. And I do love teen comedies, you know, I still do. Um, but, you know, I, I didn't want to sort of be, you know, typecast in that way. So it was very conscious that, okay, this one, I think you just evolve as, as, a, as, a, as a creative person and, and this one had been percolating for a long time, and it just got to the point where it was like, no, I really want to make this movie. I want to, I don't want to, I want to make this movie on on my own terms. Um, so it didn't come out of nowhere, but it was one that I certainly had to prioritize. So I did that, and, I, and it's certainly a direction I want to keep going in. When you began production of the film, uh, what was your approach when directing it? Um, I mean, we talk about your directing in terms of setting up the, the, the whole sort of, sort of mode of direction as well as in terms of directing actors. Um, I wanted to be as free as possible on set. So basically the idea is that we wanted to light everything with, with what's called practical lights, which are lights that exist within the, within the world of the film. Um, now, that takes a lot of planning to do and do well, because I still want, because you can do that, and you can do that sometimes fairly simply, but often then the the visuals do suffer to some degree. So um, if you want to make it still look good and, and, and tell your story dramatically using light, but use practicals, that takes a lot of planning. So we put a lot of thought into to building lights into the actual set itself. And that meant that I could actually be very free on set and there wouldn't be a, a big change around for lights or waiting for, for lights. We could shoot very quickly. We could almost shoot it, and this is, this is what I wanted. Once we'd sort of set up the scene, we could actually shoot the scene like it was a real event. So if the actors, you know, they, once they'd rehearsed and done it, that was like, that's how they do it, and that's how we're going to shoot it. And we're almost, we're not going for a documentary style whatsoever, but there was this idea that, you know, it gave it a level of authenticity. Um, and it just meant that we could, we could have a real flow to the shooting, and, and that links into to, 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 to the working with the actors. And I think it was, 
you know, very helpful for the actors that there wasn't lots of stop start. We could shoot very, very quickly in a very fluid way. And I, I think that really helped the performances. You have described the film in the past as a scientific, philosophical romance. Uh, have, did you think that would be a risk when you began production to do that type of film? I think so. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the idea of the, the scientific, philosophical romance is a kind of mouthful. So that's why we changed it to alternate reality romantic mystery. Um, although I still quite like the scientific philosophical romance because it is a little bit clunky, weirdly. And even if you think about the title, it's OX to be the manual. It's a kind of clunky title. Um, but I don't know this, this, was, this was my chance to, to, to do a film that I wanted to do in, on, in the way that I wanted to do it. So I, I had basically complete creative freedom, which meant if it's going to fail miserably, it's completely my fault. Okay? And, that, and you don't often get that chance to, to, to be that free. So, yeah, it was complete risk, but I think it was, you know, it was my passion to tell a story. And in one hand, the telling of the story is very unconventional. On the other hand, the telling of the story is completely conventional in terms of, you know, the idea of a boy meets girl story. Um, so the trick was to sort of take, still have a, a satisfying, you know, um, story experience for, for the audience but to still push the boundaries. And it's like, this is my chance to push those boundaries, but I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to rewrite the rules of filmmaking. I don't want to rewrite the rules of storytelling. I want to be ambitious with the stories that I want to tell. So on the one hand, you can, you know, it is risky, but, but, but I think, I think people respond to, to, to passion and respond to a vision. And this is a chance to just to, to run with that vision. And go, okay, yes, you know, it's a scientific philosophical romance, run with it. You haven't seen one before. You may never see one again, you know, but, but, you know, it's, it's something that, you know, is, is interesting maybe for your palette of watching movies, you know, so. It seems like the project is really a, a dream project for you. Uh, is there any memorable moments while during the production? Um, there's been lots of moments all the way, you know, all the way through the process. Um, and I'll, t I'll tell you, I'll tell you through now, uh, since you ask. Um, yeah, it's been a real labor of love, absolutely. Um, and... Um, you know, we spent five months in casting and there were like, you know, key moments like certain auditions where they just came in and like, bang, they were the character, they were the character. And, and, and the great thing about casting is, you know, you've got an idea in your head, but if somebody comes in, it isn't maybe what you had when they walked in the room, but when they've left the room, they've got the part because they've just brought so much to it. And there were some very exciting moments there. On a personal note, um, I became a father, like through in the middle of production. <laughs> As in, I, Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, so that was interesting with, uh, with my wife coming on to set, you know, to, to, to give me the news privately. And, um, and I couldn't tell anybody else because, you know, you, you wait the three months to, you know, to tell. So suddenly I realized I'm going to be a father and then I'm directing, you know, uh, a whole weekend of children. So I was suddenly practicing my dad voice. So that was, that was kind of interesting. So it's all kind of wound up to, to, together. Uh, funny, just uh, 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 something that will, will stick in my memory forever just happened actually here at the festival which was David Broughton Davis, who plays uh, Strauss in the film. Um, he's come to Montreal as well, and, and um, uh, we're here together. And he, he was landing at 6 p.m. in Montreal, and the screening, the world premiere, 7 p.m. So it was unlikely he was going to make it quite in time for the beginning of the film, but he'd be there for the end of the film. So watching the film, you know, big screen, and his character comes into the film half, about half an hour in, and he opens a door in the film half an hour in. And as his character opens the door, Behind me, I'm sitting at the back, the door opens, and David Broughton Davis walks in as his character walks in, I kid, I kid you not, into the film. So he saw his, he saw his, op he opened the door to see himself open the door, and then came in the room as he, you know, it was just insane. I mean, talk about frequency and timing, you know, it just felt like the universe was smiling for that moment. It was just, it was just a beautiful, beautiful thing. I, you know, I hadn't seen him for a year, and uh, just walks in the door and, and, and catches himself. So it was a magical moment. Just like uh, the theme of the film, uh, and luck and all that. Absolutely, luck and timing. Yeah, it's, it's such a it's incredible. It's such a cliche story to tell almost, but it actually happened. It happened about you know whatever it was twelve hours ago, and yeah, so that will that will stay with me. And I think probably David forever. That just it just I mean to the to the second. I mean you couldn't have timed it. You know you need to cue that in. You know <laughs> to do that again, you'd have to have a lot of organisation. But uh, yeah, so it was it was a pretty special moment. I know it's uh, still early on, but are there any projects that you want to try to work on in the near future? Yeah, definitely. I think as you know, as as as, as a writer, especially, you've always got projects, you know, um, at various stages, and it's always which one gets financed first. Um, so yeah, there's certainly 
there's, there's actually three that, you know, if, if you could wave a magic wand and said, right, you know, here's a financing, you know, what order do you want to do the films in? I've got my kind of my next one, two, three. Um, and the next one is nothing like the manual, but the, you know, that you'll, you'll see a through line in terms of, of, of working with story and character there. Um, and that's called Momentum. And that's something that I'd love to, to obviously be my, my, next, my next project. Um, I've suddenly realized that, you know, for me personally, the, the kind of films that I like to make and like to watch are what you could probably call puzzle films. You know, that they kind of either the character within the story is trying to solve some sort of puzzle or the film is presented to you as a puzzle. And I kind of like, frankly, both. So, uh, you know, uh, the manual is, is very much like that. And, and films that I'll do from, from, from certainly now on in, moving forward, will there'll always be a strong element of that, I think. Well, thank you very much for telling us, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your time here in Montreal. Great, thank you very much.